Det er nemlig noe som heter elektronisk litteratur. Og Scott Rettberg, som står her, er professor i digital kultur ved Universitetet i Bergen, og en av de leierne forskerne på dette feltet. I fjor høst så ga han ut boka Electronic Literature på Polity Press, og den boka gir en fyldig introduksjon til ulike sjangre innenfor den elektroniske litteraturen. Og boka fikk nylig tildelt en Catherine Hales Award for Criticism of Electronic Literature. Og samtidig er Rettberg selv en skaper av en rekke kunstneriske verk som gir digitale teknologier til en del av forma. Og i denne presentasjonen skal han både presentere eget kunstnerisk verk og diskutere digital litterær kunst mer generelt. Vær så god. Tusen takk. Uh, thank you for having me and thank you for this wonderful event. Um, it's great to be with uh, UC and Mercedes and, uh, and to follow a band uh, is always a, a pleasure. Is there a possibility to get the screen uh, up? Okay. Layer exercises the stone, layers frame the coves, translate the encompassing, stones trail the rippling, forests dwell, heights exercise the flow, run the sinuous, straight, objective, cool, heights frame the shapes, the crags hum, shape paces the stones, track the rough, objective, clear. Hallucination defends the fruit sellers. Mangas circle. Hacker comforts the cigarettes. Finger the mysterious floating. Yakuza's contaminate the cherry blossom. Black widows investigate. Speed racers ceremonialize the cuisines. Im eliminate the ancient chaotic. Samurais smoke the fun. Prostitutes suffer the automation. Go the to the definitive. Monk unsettles the cleric. Traffic jams destroy, Buddhas recover, rat feels the nose rings, paint the overwhelming, shabby, insanely elect eclectic, travelers bribe the robot, Jesus freaks evacuate, GJs win, retirees greet the politicians, sing the sated cacophonous. Okay, we'll come back to that. Let's see, play slideshow here. Okay, today I'd like to talk a, a little bit about my book, and I'm gonna do this uh, very briefly. I need to remember not to step outside the black line. It's, it's electrified. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about electronic literature's past and future, uh, mainly about the past, uh, since that's where I'm uh, living. Uh, and during this talk, I'd like to tell you a bit about the book, show you just a few examples of some of my own work in combinatory poetry, uh, VR narrative, and generative cinema. And then I want you to ask you to think about the potentialities of electronic literature uh, to address significant societal challenges. So I, I think I'm trying to uh, bridge between uh, the two themes of, of what you're working with in this program. Uh, so first of all, this is uh, my book that just uh, came out this year. Um, it's uh, about 240 pages, and it's focused on genres of electronic literature. And I'd like to read just a, a little bit from the first couple pages of the book. Imagine a book. That should be easy enough. You're holding one now. The book is a particular reading technology, and it's a good one. It took a long time to develop. The Codex book is portable and can be easily lugged from place to place. It is addressable. It has page numbers so I can easily communicate with you exactly where any piece of information is within its volume. We can get to the same page and read the same words. The book has a complex and multifunctional navigational apparatus. There is a table of contents, there is an index, and so the book can be navigated non-linearly. The book is verifiable. It has a copyright page with a publisher and a place and a year and an author. The book is fixed. If I put it on the shelf now and come back and pull it out 10 years later, the same words will be on the same pages as when I last opened the book. While the book can be destroyed in a fire or a flood or might slowly decay, there is a sense of permanence to it. 
One of its main functionalities is to get thoughts down in print and carry them through time. Imagine that the book were different. Imagine it offered other affordances and material properties. Imagine that instead of turning pages, you could make any word in the book a link to some other part of the book, or even some other book. Imagine if it were bound on a spool so that you could enter and exit anywhere, a book without beginning or end. Imagine what you would do with that as a storyteller. Imagine what it would mean if every time you put the book up on the shelves, the words on the book shifted order and that rearranged themselves. Would it still be the same book? What would you do with that as a poet? Imagine if when you, when you re, uh, pulled the book down from the shelf and opened the first page, the book asked you in which direction you wanted to go and would not begin to tell a story until you responded. Imagine if the book were a conversation, a novel that you had to talk to. Imagine that as you read a poem on the page of the book, the words jumped off the page into three-dimensional space and began flying around the room, shifting form and regrouping in the physical environment. Imagine that when you opened the book, it was filled with threads connecting it to all the other books in your library, which would make it possible to pull a part of another book right into the text of the one you were reading. Imagine if the book could read the newspaper and change its content depending on the time of day or the weather or the season. Imagine if you opened the book and found all those of your friends who were reading the book at the same time, leaving their comments in the margin. Imagine that when you opened the book, those same friends were all writing the book simultaneously. Imagine the book is a network, always on, always connected, and always changing. Imagine what you could do as a reader. Imagine what you could do as a writer. Imagine the book as a network computer. So how many of you have heard of electronic literature before? Okay, good, about 40%. About uh, 10 years ago when I asked that question, it would be about two people. Um, so electronic literature is essentially new forms of literature uh, that are made for the digital media and that use the properties uh, inherent to the digital media to create new forms of storytelling. However, those forms, uh, I argue in this book, aren't entirely uh, new. And one of the things I'm trying to do in this book is make new connections, oddly enough, between literature, per se, and electronic literature. The other thing that I'm trying to do is trying to explain how uh, technology is inflected and influences and shapes these new genres of electronic literature. Finally, I'm trying to make the argument that electronic literature uh, can reflect contemporary culture uh, in ways that the book alone cannot. Uh, my focus in this book is on genre, uh, and people ask me, why genre? Don't you want to be doing some sort of uh, more exciting, cutting-edge uh, theoretical approach? That's so boring. Um, and I say, well, no, the genre has a, a, particular, uh, a particular use value. Um, it, it might be sort of boring, but what happens when I talk to electronic literature authors and digital artists, they often explain that what they're doing, no one's ever done before. It's sui genre, without, uh, without predecessor. Uh, well, in fact, they want to claim uh, that, it's the, that it's the avant-garde. In fact, what's actually occurring in a lot of these works is that they're taking techniques from the historical avant-garde of the 20th century and readapting them for the computational uh, environment. So what we're ending up with is, in fact, a guard derriere. I need to credit Talon Mehmet, who's a, a friend of mine, with that. Uh, and in literary studies, we often think of two things, either uh, rupture, which is this sort of breaking with tradition, and too much of the discourse, I think, is maybe centered on this idea that the digital is this rupture um, with, the, with the old. But continuity is the other thing that we look at. We look at threads of practice that move across space and time. And that's what actually builds a field. Uh, so in this case, genre is a sort of toolbox. Uh, many of the works that we look at borrow from many of the different genres that I, that I reference uh, in different ways and recombine them. But we think of them as threads of practice. So the five threads of practice that I look at in the book, the oldest form of digital literature is combinatory poetics, and this has its roots uh, actually early in the Dada through the, the Surrealist, but also at the very start of computation. The first person to create a text genera uh, generator, arguably Christopher Strachey, was a close friend of Alan Turing, so it actually stretches back that far. 
Um, hypertext fiction, which is the first form of digital literature that really attracted a lot of criticism and has a lot of deep connections to uh, postmodernism. Uh, interactive fiction, how many of you, this will be a good test of the, the age in the room, how many of you remember Zork? Okay, yeah. So Zork was this, the, the earliest computer games were text adventure games and, and that form uh, died out very quickly with, uh, with the, the graphics card in personal computers. However, there was this community of people who really missed typing and having conversations with the computer as a way to, to navigate a textual space who kept creating in this form and even wrote their, their own software, uh, their own platforms, created their own uh, award series, and kept this going over a span of uh, about 30 years now. Um, and uh, it's actually become a much more interesting literary form than it used to be during the days when it was the best-selling computer game uh, you could get on the market. Uh, kinetic and interactive poetry, these are forms uh, that, that in a way derive from if we think of historical concrete poetry or visual poetry uh, that just integrate the element of movement and audio and integrate interactive uh, multimedia elements. And then what I call network writing, which is writing that's made specifically for the network and that reflects uh, network processes, that reflects the changes that are occurring in language, uh, that reflects the communication forms, and that in some cases reflect critically upon the network apparatus and the sort of global uh, corporate uh, apparatus of computing. Um, so I won't, I won't go through all of the, the chapters in much detail, except to say that the first chapter deals with the, uh, the idea of genre and looks at the, the special case of genre here, where we have genres, not only literary genres, but genres that are, for instance, software, can, can a particular type of software can influence the form of a particular type of literature or art, which is new. Um, and I sort of go through the history of, of the criticism of electronic literature. I have a chapter on combinatory poetics, where we start back actually with the, the cut-up experiments and the exquisite corpses of the Dada, and we trace this through to the earliest text generators uh, and into the present, where we have poetry generating bots on Twitter and people now uh, even using GANs and other sorts of uh, machine learning to generate poetry. And I'll show you a bit of, I showed you actually a bit of uh, my generative poetry. Uh, hypertext fiction, which derives, has close connections to postmodernism um, and really moved through uh, several spans before the web uh, into the web where it changed form. Uh, and then uh, afterwards where it's influenced many other forms of, of digital literature and digital art. Uh, interactive fiction, as I mentioned, uh, kinetic poetry, uh, which very interestingly has all these connections to the historical 20th century avant-garde, even visual poetry, sound poetry, even things like movie title sequences uh, have influenced uh, this form. And of course the technologies themselves. Uh, into network writing where we look at things like code work, which is uh, work that uses computer language along with human language, a flarf, which is essentially Google poetry, things like email novels, uh, collective narrative uh, novels or, or fictions that are written by large groups of people, uh, small groups sometimes, but sometimes groups of hundreds of people, uh, and netprov, which is a network-based improvisational uh, performance uh, form that unfolds on things like social networks, as well as forms that critique the network apparatus. And then the last chapter, I look at these sort of extensions of these threads of practice uh, into other art forms, into things like uh, locative narrative, interactive installations, and then expanded cinema that I'll show you uh, just a little, a little bit of that afterwards. So if you're interested in electronic literature, really quick where to find it. Uh, the Electronic Literature Organization has published three free anthologies, uh, the Electronic Literature Collections, um, and there's, there's a ton of work out there that aren't in the collections, but each of these has 40 plus uh, works that demonstrate many different genres and practices uh, of electronic literature. Uh, we also put out the, the Elm Sip Anthology, which was the first anthology of European electronic literature, and at the University of Bergen, we maintain the electronic literature knowledge base, uh, which includes thousands of records 
uh, documenting works of electronic literature, criticism of electronic literature, uh, authors, uh, events, and that's a that's an ongoing uh, an ongoing project that we continue to this day. Okay, so let me show you a couple of works. First, let's come back to uh, to Taroko Gorge uh, and Tokyo Garage. <clears throat> So this is an interesting case that I think demonstrates a lot of things about the, the, the practices in this community and sort of the ethos of the electronic literature community. Um, and it also is, involves a joke on my part. Um, my friend Nick Montfort, who's an author and has done a lot of work with poetry generators, uh, in 2009 put up this Taroko Gorge, which is a nature poetry generator. Uh, it's, it generates a, a long flowing meditative poem about uh, a national park in Taiwan. Um, I, saw the, I, I saw this online, he, he sent me a link to it, and I spent a little bit of time with it and I looked at the code base uh, in which he'd written it, a very, really very simple JavaScript poem, uh, uh, code. And then I, I opened that up and I thought, well, maybe I could tweak this a little bit, right? So, and it's a very simple, uh, very simple process actually, because I took his code, and then all that I did was I substituted all of the vocabulary. Uh, I changed the color scheme, I crossed out his name, uh, put my name uh, into it, uh, sped it up a little bit, changed some elements, and then I sent it to him, I sent a link to it, I put it on the web and sent a link back to Nick and said, uh, thanks Nick, I've improved your poem. Um, and I published it online, and Nick got very excited about this, so he, he, pub he, pub he wrote something about this on his, his blog. Um, and then what happened after that is really uh, quite amazing, uh, in that uh, J.R. Carpenter, uh, a, a couple of or a month or two later, uh, took the same uh, gesture uh, and created Gorge, uh, which is a poem about, uh, about eating and digestion. And then, um, let's see, Eric Snodgrass uh, created Yoko Engorged, which is a, a poem about uh, the effect of Yoko Ono's relationship with John Lennon on the Beatles. Um, and it just, went, uh, it just went on and on, Ty K. George. So uh, in the end, dozens of people ended up taking the same uh, underlying code structure, modifying the language, and taking the same architecture and then creating new works of poetry um, out of it. Um, and to this day, we, it's still used in many classes around the world. Uh, actually, dissert, there's been a dissertation written exclusively about, uh, about this, uh, this poetry program. Uh, and it's become one of these crazy, uh, most sort of famous works of electronic literature. Uh, very odd. Nick didn't take much time to write it. And I took a, a couple of days to, uh, to destroy it and, uh, and recreate it, and it's, it's since become this uh, phenomena. And that's the sort, of, uh, the sort of sharing, joking, and play that I think characterizes the electronic literature community as a whole. Um, I want to show a couple of projects uh, really quickly um, that, are, that take some of the ideas of poetry generation uh, and I've been working for the last eight years with a, a filmmaker, uh, Roderick Coover, and other collaborators. Uh, but what we're, what we're trying to do is take some of these ideas of how we recombine elements uh, and, and play with them sort of creatively, but take algorithms to restructure uh, films uh, rather, than, rather than poetry. And I won't say too much about toxicity, but I'll, I'll show you a clip. Um, let me show you how this actually works first. Uh, this was a commission from the Chemical Heritage Foundation Museum in Philadelphia, and they were doing an exhibition called Sensing Change, where they wanted to use some uh, scientific research uh, about climate change and then develop artworks and narratives uh, out of that. Uh, so we decided to do this combinatory film. Uh, and, and what happens is the, the film creates a new version every time it's shown. It's structured very much like a poem in that you have, uh, you have a beginning and there's a beginning sequence that it pulls from one of three possible beginnings. Uh, and then there's two buckets of content that are a, a speculative narrative of the near future, 
where it pulls in uh, one, an A clip and a B clip, two different sort of uh, structured uh, parts of the narrative. Uh, and then there's this thing, this death course, which is uh, stories of people who actually died in, in Hurricane Sandy. And we were making this, we started making this right about the time that that hurricane, uh, that that hurricane hit um, the area where Rod lives in, in Philadelphia and the island uh, where I used to live before I moved to Norway, uh, Brigantine, which was pretty much completely uh, uh, wiped out. Um, during Hurricane Sandy. So it, it's something that we both uh, sort of felt significantly. So I'll just show you the, the trailer here. Can we get the lights down, please? And this one. I remember when it all began, at least when it really started to get worse. I was just a kid when the big floods started. There had always been flooding, of course, but not the big ones that take out roads and rewrite shorelines. When the real storms started coming, all of them hurricanes, one after the other, all these places that had never flooded before were getting hit. I used to spend a lot of time down in the basement. Money was tight in the recession, and sometimes mom and dad would argue, and it seemed like a safe place. I remember one night I was down there painting things, scenes of things like I sometimes did, listening to the rain and the walls cracked. The foundation fractured and the water seeped through. The water had a strange smell to it and it got worse and worse over time. There was a lot of mopping. Finally, the walls and floors came off kilter and tiles and things came off, floorboards coming off and stuff. By the time the inspector said we had to move, the house itself was at a strange angle, like the Leaning Tower of Pisa or something. The Everett's died of blunt force trauma as they were trying to make their escape from Randolph. A large old oak about 33 inches in diameter fell approximately 100 feet, crushing the cabin of their Chevrolet Silverado. Their two boys, 11 and 14 years old, were in the back seat and escaped unharmed. I was proud of the way we handled the first big storms. I'd say we did pretty well. A lot of people died. A lot of people. It was a catastrophic event but we could have had many, many more fatalities if we hadn't rehearsed and coordinated and had such a great communication system in place. Then, the sequesters came. You know we had to cut 5% in 2013? That might not sound like much, but it was a billion dollar haircut. Staff, services, supplies, trailers, blankets. And then we had four hurricanes in a row. All the problems with the chemical plants and water treatment facilities, all the toxins that leached up into the water supply, the meltdown in New Jersey, it hit everything, flooded every part of the system. We had every agency, from the National Guard to the Army Corps of Engineers to the NRC to OSHA to the FERC, Port Authority, Homeland on down, everybody trying to coordinate relief and reconstruction. Just as soon as we had one situation stabilized, we'd have another event. And what did Congress do? Once we'd blown past the year's budget, they called us to the carpet. Then they cut the budgets again in 15, 16, and 17. It was the death of logical thinking. Okay, I won't show the whole thing, but that gives you a, a sense of what the film's about. Um, so it produces a 45-minute version of the film. Um, there's actually about uh, an hour and a half or so of material. And I think poetically it functions in that there's uh, one of the reasons why we use the combinatory technique here and why it recombines is that those death stories, I did research on everyone who died in the state of New Jersey uh, where, I, where I used to live in Hurricane Sandy. So there were, there were actually about 40 stories uh, of these individual lives. 
And what we were trying to do is to sort of capture the singularity of these disasters and maybe create an affect uh, that's different from when you just read a newspaper uh, account of X number of people uh, died in this, this climate change related incident. Uh, finally, if there's, how are we doing for time? Do I have another five minutes? Yeah, three. Three, okay. Okay, great. Uh, so finally, I'll just show you uh, the, the beginning of, uh, of the trailer for, um, uh, for Hearts and Minds, the Interrogations Project, uh, which is a, this, this is a work where Roderick and I worked in a cave, a three-dimensional virtual reality theater environment with Daria Supakova and Arthur Nishimoto. Uh, and we worked with uh, some social scientists who had interviewed uh, soldiers who had uh, either tortured prisoners or witnessed acts of torture uh, during uh, the Iraq and Afghanistan uh, conflicts. My father oh, was sort of a strange man. No, nope, that's the wrong clip. Sorry. Let's just do it from here. First deployment when we just sort of rolled into Baghdad and people were taking down statues and cheering and everything you really oh really had a sense that this was going to turn into a humanitarian mission that we were really there to win hearts and minds we were going to build something but some of the guys had a saying from Vietnam let me win your hearts and minds or I'll burn your damn huts down and one of my drill sergeants used to say, when you want to finish someone, when you're clearing bodies in the fields, that's how you do it. One in the heart, two in the mind. A lot of the techniques were not like something we were trained in. We're just grunts, you know. I mean, orders come down and they're very nonspecific. Like, uh, do whatever is necessary to do to obtain the objective. Like that. Whatever means necessary. So you hear things in the mess hall or whatever, like the, that battalion intelligence is doing certain things. Techniques, like uh, waterboarding, tasers, cattle prods military police dogs, and the electric chair stress position. And we get curious, because we're out there, and we need to get info too. Our lives are on the line, and they don't teach us any of this. So we heard about waterboarding, and we were talking about it. We were in a town for the night, and my squad leader was like, we need to try that out. That might be useful in the field. Okay, so that gives you a sense of the project. And one of the interesting things about Hearts and Minds is we've shown it in a number of different environments. It was made for that uh, cave space, but we've shown it in other uh, 3D theater environments, uh, planetariums, as well as kind of 2D theaters. And we've shown it a bunch of different venues, uh, human rights festivals, uh, the Nobel Peace Prize Forum in, uh, in Minneapolis. And Often with people in the audience who've been, um, who, who've, who've been prisoners of conscience uh, and people who in fact had been uh, tortured. Uh, so what, what, what usually happened when we show the work is it's not just the, the experience 
of watching it uh, together uh, with a crowd in virtual reality. Uh, it's also a, a period of discussion uh, afterwards where we're trying to collectively uh, really just discuss what our, ide our ideas of, uh, of the use of these enhanced interrogation uh, techniques uh, results in, not only for the, the victims of torture, but also for the, the perpetrators. And this is something that I didn't think would be an ongoing issue when we started the, the project. We thought that it would sort of be relegated to history, but it turns out uh, it's still uh, part of the, the discourse today. So I just wanted to sort of conclude with that and with this argument that uh, these new technologies can enable us not only to create artworks, uh, but to communicate things like scientific research, but also the societal challenges uh, that we're facing today uh, in new ways that can affect us and create a different environment for listening and experiencing uh, than say print alone or say documentary film uh, alone uh, could do. So thank you very much.